Welcome to 1812 Channel. July 1812, Canada invaded. Note, sources for the following information will be listed in the description for your enjoyment and edification. The barrage has finally lifted, so over the top we go. According to Pierre Burton in his The Invasion of Canada, Brigadier General William Hall, commander of the Army of the Northwest, finally learns of the American declaration of war against Great Britain on July the 2nd, two weeks late. On July the 2nd, while encamped near the Maumee River, which is near present-day Maumee, Ohio, after informing his officers and swearing them to secrecy, Hull sends a boat after the schooner Cuyahoga Packet, which had left the Maumee bound for Detroit, carrying 30 officers and men too ill to march. And... And... And Hull's personal and official correspondence. Treasure trove indeed. Hull is right to be worried. As the schooner passes Emmitsburg slash Fort Malden, near the mouth of the Detroit River at Lake Erie, it is boarded by Provincial Marine Lieutenant Frederick Rowlett, who captures the vessel. The British quickly realize the value of Hull's correspondence. As Pierre Burton says, it is, quote, a fine equal to the breaking of an enemy code, end of quote. The contents are quickly sent to Major General Isaac Brock in York, now Toronto, who instantly recognizes their value. While all this was going on, several jurisdictions announced their intention of sitting the war out. According to 4gwar.wordpress.com, on July the 2nd, Connecticut Governor Roger Griswold said his state's militia would not be serving in the war, while the very next day, July the 3rd, Pierre Burton says, quote, The Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia issued a proclamation that his province and New Brunswick would abstain from predatory warfare against their neighbors. End of quote. On June the 26th, the Massachusetts legislature had already issued a statement in condemnation of the war. On July the 4th, a riot broke out in Montreal when the Governor General of Canada, Sir George Prevost, attempted to conscript 2,000 men into the militia. When the protesters attempted to flee the area, they were followed by soldiers from the 49th Regiment and shots were exchanged, killing two civilians. On scene, Sir George used his diplomatic skills to defuse the situation, pardoning the rioters with the exception of the ringleaders. As a result of his intervention, the French-Canadian majority in Lower Canada, i.e. Quebec, remained loyal to the British during the war. William Hull and his troops finally arrive in Detroit on July the 5th after what Pierre Burton describes as a 35-day struggle through the wilderness. In The Invasion of Canada, Burton describes their destination, Detroit, as a settlement of 1,200, mainly French-Canadian people, on the, quote, outskirts of a log fort, end of quote. Primarily hunters, the locals are unable to feed Hull's troops, leaving him reliant on a 200-mile supply line, skirting the waterways and vulnerable to attack from both the British and Native warriors. On July the 12th, Hull finally crosses from Detroit, landing at Sandwich, now part of Windsor, Ontario, and he installs himself in the town's most palatial home, which belongs to an old and uh, 
soon-to-be former friend, Lieutenant Colonel Francois Bobby. Shortly after arriving in Canada, Hull issues a proclamation to the inhabitants claiming to have come in peace and asking them to remain aloof from hostilities. However, however, the proclamation also includes the lines, quote, No white man found fighting by the side of an Indian will be taken prisoner. Instant destruction will be his lot. End of quote. Pierre Burton thinks these threatening lines stiffened the resolve of the local Canadian inhabitants to resist the invaders, as the Canadian militia would be, would be, found fighting with the native warriors, and, according to the proclamation, be subject to instant destruction. Instant destruction. Well, if they're going to kill you anyways, you might as well fight. But, what do you think, dear listeners? Please share your thoughts about this in the comments below. On July the 16th, the Battle of the River Canard, Canard is duck in French, takes place partway between Sandwich and Fort Malden. It was more of a skirmish than an actual battle, and like so many engagements in this war, its results were largely inconclusive. It was also the first action of the War of 1812 in Canada. An American force of 280 men, under the command of Colonels Lewis Cass and James Miller, had been dispatched by General Hall to scout for the presence of British troops, and they encountered a British force of regulars from the 41st Foot, plus native warriors and Canadian militia, guarding the bridge over the River Cunard. These troops were under the overall command of Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bly St. George, commander at Fort Malden. Cass's men managed to flank the British, who retreated to Fort Malden. However, Hull, fearful of his troops' distance from the main American forces, ordered them back. Two British regulars had been captured during the engagement. James Hancock and John Dean. Both had been wounded. Hancock died later in the day while Dean had his left arm amputated. Hancock has erroneously been identified as the first British casualty of the war, but that dubious honor must go to some unknown seaman killed on July 23rd aboard HMS Belvedere during its encounter with USS President. However, Hancock was the first British soldier to die in the War of 1812 in Canada. Source, Burton. Skirmishing between the two sides at the Canard will continue until July the 25th when a party of 117 Americans are ambushed by 22 Menominee warriors under Toma. During the three-hour fight, six Americans are killed, two are captured, while one Menominee warrior was killed. Fort Mackinac, on Mackinac Island, was a fur trading post on the Straits of uh, Mackinac, which divides Lakes Michigan and Huron. On July 17th, it was commanded by Lieutenant Porter Hanks who led a mere 61 artillerymen. Hanks only learns of the outbreak of the war when the island was invaded by a combined force of around 600 men, consisting of British regulars, fur traders, voyageurs, and First Nations warriors, under the command of Captain Charles Roberts, a veteran British officer suffering badly from ill health. Meanwhile, at sea, the USS Constitution, a 44-gun frigate under the command of Captain Isaac Hull, Isaac Hull, nephew of General William Hull, encounters 
on July the 16th and 17th, a British frigate accompanied by four or five other vessels. Hull, who is a chubby fellow, like his uncle, but who is, unlike his uncle, a fighter, decides he's outnumbered in this instance and decides to leave. Alas, alas, the wind wouldn't blow and the ship wouldn't go. Hmm. Where's Carter when you need him? The, the wind wouldn't blow and the ship wouldn't go. So Hull decides using the Constitution's longboats to pull him out of the way. But the British employ the same trick to keep up the chase. Hull then resorts to kedging. Kedging, which involves dropping an anchor or anchors at a point in front of the ship, then winding the capstan to draw the vessel forward to that position to then repeat the whole laborious process over again. But after 60 hours of this, the wind finally picks up and Hull is able to make his getaway to fight another day. On July 19th, five vessels belonging to the Provincial Marine, a Canadian Coast Guard operated by the Royal Navy, appeared off Sackett's Harbor, the chief American shipbuilding yard, which was situated along the shore of Lake Ontario in Upper New York, west of Watertown. The British had captured an American merchant ship but released her crew to take the following demands to shore. The surrender of USS Oneida and of the Lord Nelson, a British merchant ship the Americans had captured prior to the outbreak of war. The Oneida attempted to break out of the harbor, but returned when the British forces fired at it. When the British dropped anchor, the Oneida was turned so that nine of its guns faced the enemy, the rest being taken ashore and placed on a breastwork near a 32-pound gun, which had been intended for the Oneida, but which had been found to be too heavy for the ship. The alarm was sounded to summon the local militia, but while some 3,000 had assembled by the end of the day, they were not a factor in the battle. The first shot, was fired from the 32-pounder, but fell short, provoking raucous laughter from the British fleet. <laughs> hey, I like that. A war with a sense of humor. The British then returned the compliment. The shots from both sides had failed to inflict any casualties until a 24-pounder struck the stern of the British flagship, Royal George, raking her and killing eight seamen. As the flagship had been badly damaged, the retreat was sounded and the fleet returned to port in Kingston, Upper Canada, now Kingston, Ontario. July 28th. Isaac Brock, in his role as the administrator of Upper Canada, addresses the legislature regarding the war. Brock, according to Pierre Burton, has little faith in either the loyalty of the population of Upper Canada, the majority of whom were actually born in the U.S., nor does he have any faith in their ability to fight effectively. Still, he lavishes them and their First Nations allies with praise to stiffen resistance and to deal with potential traitors Brock asked the legislators to suspend habeas corpus and to impose martial law, but they decline. But one thing Brock does do is to send Colonel Henry Proctor, a more energetic soldier, to replace Thomas Bly St. George at Fort Malden. Proctor arrives at Emmitsburg on July the 26th. And we will be hearing more, more of Proctor later. 
Whatever we know about Brock, he was a soldier, not a politician like Prevost. He longs to leave York in order to hurry to Fort Malden to confront William Hall. Will he make it? Stay tuned. If this is your first visit to 1812 Channel, my name is Warren, and I will be your host. I'm not a historian, nor am I an expert on the War of 1812. Instead, I'm a student wishing to learn more about the conflict. Each month, for the roughly three years of the war, I will outline the major events. I will also review a book on the war. So, today, did I miss anything? Any errors? If so, then please let me know in the comments below. And see you next month when the barrage lifts. Cheers. Oh, man. <laughs> I think today my throat is a belated casualty of the War of 1812. Oh. <sighs>